Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves. Where's Johnny? <laughs> He'll be here in a minute. More importantly, I feel like this intro is very underwhelming now, but we need a, your own theme tune, some fanfare, at least a drum roll. Two-time back-to-back Champions Cup winner and new European Player of the Year, Greg Aldrich. How are you doing? Hi, doing well, doing well. Recovering from my last week was quite a, a tough one, so no, I'm, I'm better now, better now. <laughs> we'll come on to the celebrations and where the hell Johnny is in a minute, but how does it feel, that title? Are you getting used to it? Uh, it was insane, insane. Same feeling as last year, like you don't realise when you're you're still on the field, but uh, coming back to La Rochelle, seeing uh, all the fans on the on the arbor and, and cheering for us um, was really... Um, really deep like deep uh, and um as well lots of uh, texts of uh, all the french rugby uh, from old coach or partners so um, yeah, yeah kind of start realizing what we uh, what we did in dublin and personally the european player of the year is that something you kind of just brush off or is that something that really makes you reflect and and look at how far you've come no of course i'm grateful to be a uh, european player of the year but I'm not. I was not working for that, you know. Uh, you arrived because as well, my teammate did an amazing job. But uh, I'm grateful. I'm really happy, and I'll be able to show that to my kids. So that's uh, that's important for me. But when uh, when I work uh, at the gym or on the field at training, it's um, definitely not to get this uh, kind of title. It's to get the the big one. So the thing most important is that uh, I got uh, I got both on this day so it was uh, just a perfect day for me absolutely you mentioned the celebrations we'll chat about them a bit more but what time did you get back to La Rochelle because we saw the scenes and there were thousands of people still there middle of the night first of all we left it was since three in the afternoon like normally everybody at work but uh, everybody was in front of the airport and I remember a guy like Astoy or Lespio who didn't knew that uh, uh, from, from last year like there was Already impressed, but when we arrived, I think it was 4 a.m. 4 a.m. in the morning, like full of fans, um, all with their flags and singing for us. Well, like, that's the moment, like you realize, like um, about the thing and how important is uh, is it for for them. So, no, it was uh, the first uh, wow impression we get uh, we got before before going to um, to town. And 4 a.m. How are you feeling at 4 a.m.? Oh, I was just waking up from a from a nap in the plane because uh, not enough beers in the plane, so I had to <laughs> to have a, a quick nap. I said uh, it will help me for for the for the rest of the day. So um, now I was fresh and ready to uh, to go at the at the stadium. Uh, the club like had a, a kind of. Uh, uh, reception with our families and so I uh, was really looking forward to go over there to have drinks and uh, all together before before maybe going to town. And I'm going to get Johnny to do the formal apology for why we didn't do a podcast last week when he arrives because God knows where he is keeping the European Player of the Year waiting. But we didn't do one. You had a very good excuse. You were celebrating long and hard. Johnny can give his own excuse when he arrives. But talk us through it because the celebration in the harbour that's kind of day two I guess the day afterwards you've had a night on it you have another celebration on the Sunday that looks pretty special in the harbour Rog is there with a cigar Raymond Rule is there but we have the, the chance to get a fantastic club and a fantastic staff because you know we won it last year they could have said like uh, oh come on guys uh, it's normal no it's not <laughs> normal and that's that was the words of Rog like Guys, you did something. It's not normal. So now you work hard for for it. So uh, party up for, uh, for maybe four or five days, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we uh, we get back to work and uh, we prepare the the rest of the season. But uh, just uh, realize that it, there is nothing normal in what you did, and I think that it was a good speech from them. And in England, we have a phrase, day three is better than day two in terms of the celebration. You mentioned four or five days. At what day does it start getting, oh, this is too much? <laughs> no, no, no. I think we had, uh, we stopped on Wednesday. So Wednesday night, that's a, a kind of tradition. You know, we, um, after the title, we celebrate and we we end with a barbecue at Roch Place. So nice. all, the, all the players, all the staff, 
goes over there and we have a, a barbecue with, uh, with him, with uh, the families. And, and this is kind of the end of the celebration. Um, and we get back on uh, a training on Thursday. And uh, yes, like that's uh, Roger's well, uh, speech is, guys, it was incredible uh, to party that. But now I want you to be uh, really focused and uh, no more party until the in, until the final because uh, of course there is a semi final, like he likes to call it final two and after final one. So so um, before the final two semi final, uh, no party, no drinking. So I think everybody is really concerned and really now like there is a lot of excitation, still a lot of excitation. And you mentioned the barbecue on the Wednesday was at Roger's house. I said he had a cigar with Raymond Rawl. He was obviously loving life at the parade and probably for a, a couple of days afterwards as well, before turning his head and all of yours to the top 14. But is that what makes him so special as a head coach? Obviously, his brain is massive. He loves rugby, eats and breathes it, and is a brilliant head coach. But similar to his mentor, who he mentioned in his speech after Scott Robertson, those guys kind of connect with players in a in a different way and as well as being very obviously the boss they're kind of one of you guys as well well you know first of all he's been a player before us so and he won a champions cup before us so i think he you know same uh, number what of he... times as you now greg yeah <laughs> <laughs> well he has two more as a coach but uh no you know yeah. the feeling of, of of winning it you know so i think he didn't forget that and he understand that uh after like for um, what I try to do and what we all try to do as a club is that all this, the club, the club um, administration, um, the staff, the players, we are all in the same boat, all working uh, in the same way for the same objective. So, like, of course, uh, when we party, we always uh, the staff with us and we just do a, a good mix because uh, and this creates uh, big links between, uh, between us and maybe it's our strength as well. Yeah, and you mentioned... That Rog was very clear, this isn't normal. Of course, it's not normal. For the rest of us on the outside, Craig, winning back-to-back -back Champions Cup is not normal. But this might be asking someone to say which kid they like the best. But the first one and the second one, can you say which one was better? Well, so hard. <laughs> uh, so hard because it was so different. Like the first one, first title of the club was just amazing. Like, um, well... Uh, uh, winning the, uh, the title in Marseille um, was really big emotion for us for the club. But uh, the second one is winning against Leinster in Dublin after being uh, 17 points behind. This is crazy magic around this one around this uh, second one. So no, or honestly, impossible to uh, to choose between both. And just briefly on that winning it in Leinster's own backyard, obviously that special. But you and Ronan after the game were both talking about, you know, the coin toss, the accommodation for the families, the aftermatch function being at Lansdowne Rugby Club was what Ronan was talking about. So just give us an insight into, was there a genuine feeling of kind of you were disrespected a, a little bit? And I know that Ronan said you were treated as kind of the, the little club. Obviously, they were at home. And you can maybe mention slightly what happened with James Ryan and the, the coin toss. But was that all a genuine feeling or was it something that you guys used to motivate yourself but it's it's a genuine uh, general feeling but not only was Leinster to be honest eh? it was a lot of club like La Rochelle is still a little club um, and I think now maybe uh, we'll be considered as well like uh, like a big club and um, and that's it after all happens uh, around the game like it's doesn't, doesn't matter at the end um, but we of course, we we are a club who respect a lot uh, the 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 old all the team, and uh, we just want to to be uh, to be on the same uh, same level, same stand. And your personal accolade, which you got on the pitch afterwards, the family of Anthony Foley giving you the European Player of the Year award, only the second French winner as well. No, of course, crazy, crazy, and um, as well, uh, um, yeah, like I said, it's. Individual uh, award, but um, please, please to get to get one, of course. But uh, you know, when you what I was saying, like 
when you arrive at the uh, at the end of uh, of the of the uh, of the final and you have like three Leinster men in the in the final five and only one uh, Laosha guy, I think Leps Botia could have been uh, European Player of the Year. Will Skelton, Will Yachton, so many players, so many players. So, of course, like uh, I'm grateful, but um, I'm I'm not like uh, only focused on the on the individual uh, trophy. Oh, here he is. He's turned up. Uh, yeah, oh, this sorry. is the, Johnny. This is the European Player of the Year, two-time back-to-back champion, and you keep him waiting. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. Well done, Greg. Congratulations, mate. Thanks, Johnny. Apologies for my tardiness. We will save the excuses and the explanation until after we finish with Greg, Johnny, because he's a busy man. He's got other appointments. We've got another 10, 15 minutes. So. Mate, we're see- I'm seeing Greg in person on Thursday. So we're catching up as well on Thursday. So looking forward to that. But yeah, I want to ask already the mentality behind going down so quickly and so sharply and then getting everyone under the posts, the conversations that you had, letting everyone know that it was okay and just plugging away. But what were the sort of words that you were coming to? You're a skipper in that situation, which isn't easy. It's not an easy situation to be in, but it seemed very composed, a faith in yourselves and your systems and you came back. So what did you say? Well, we know on the um, the two last game uh, against Leinster that the team who started the game really, really hard, really strong. Uh, they have uh, the twenty first minutes against them are really, really tough, really tough. Um, so just before the game, I said to the guys, um, if we're twenty twenty points uh, down or twenty points up, just stay focused, stay on the strategy, and you see everything will will go will go well. And uh, we're joking after the game because it's exactly what happens, you know. <laughs> we were seventeen down, and um, you know when I was under the post, you know. No exhalation. Um, just Antoine and Stoy saying like we're gonna kick here. Uh, okay, pressure there. We stay over there. Like everybody was focused on their job. And for when you're a skipper like this, it's really easy for you to uh, to to focus the, the guys. You called it before the game, but you honestly stood there under the post, seventeen 0 down, a man in the sim bin. You were like, it's still on. We can do this. Yeah, because we. We are sure of our strength, you know. Um, and like I was saying, last year we were as well in. Uh, we we spent a tough twenty first minutes. Uh, two years ago, we we did spend two uh, twenty minutes as well, tough twenty minutes. So uh, we know uh, we know that, and um, and uh, we just wanted to to do it as well. I think uh, lots of players wanted to to leave this cup as well, really hard um, to be in a stadium uh, as well against you, like uh, give you as well strength, really, really. Um, just your family there and you, you know, we, um, and I think one point really important that Rog said before the game as well, it's that we were here to do a, a job, to do a business, you know, no emotion. He doesn't want emotion. Uh, he doesn't, he didn't touch, uh, talk to us about like family or stuff like this. It was only job, business, Stay focused and uh, keep the emotion for Sunday, you know. And then half time, obviously, that score from Satini just before half time, massive. But given that he's all business, what does Ronan O'Gara say at half time? And does he do the talking or does does he leave a lot of that to the players? Well, first of all, we just arrived in the in, um, in the changing room. Everybody have a seat, you know. We have a breeze. Just calm down, calm down. Stay here. Uh, because you you know the first um, reflex is maybe to go and talk to him, talk to him. No, just have a sit, calm down. And Antoine normally takes the um, take a bit of a speech on the strategy. Uh, Antoine Astoy, um after we've got some players speaking about line out stuff like this. So everybody's uh, still focused on the on their job. And after Roach coming, say like guys. Uh, it was 17 nil, and now it's uh, 23 14. So the last 20 minutes, it was uh, 14 to six. You know, so the dynamic is on us, and keep going, keep going. Last year we were eight point behind, now we are nine point behind. So it's nothing, nothing new for us. You know, it is incredible, mate. How much was made? Like, were you aware of the scrap at half time? So obviously the press has talked about Rog, Johnny Sexton, Sean O'Brien, and and Big Will Skelton having to step in, but 
Were you aware of that at halftime, or was that just something that you picked up after the game? No, the, when I arrived in the in the tunnel, it was the end of it. So I just took everybody to say, uh, "Come on, guys, and uh, let." We don't need that. Uh, this is staff uh, staff job. Just the players to keep uh, keep focus. And aside from that halftime controversy, obviously Leinster didn't seem very happy with the referee. What was your kind of feeling on the pitch? Obviously, there was a lot of talk around the breakdown, which is always a massive area for you in particular. But as a captain, how did you find the kind of communication with Yako Piper and how he was refereeing the re- breakdown? Were you able to just focus on your job? Well, you know, you don't need to to lose a lot of energy with the ref. Like that was as well a speech from from everybody. Like no excuse, guys. No excuse. We as a ref don't uh, will not win the game for us. Um, Leinster will not lose the game for us. It's us to uh, to go on the pitch and give everything to win it. And um, and of course on the on the first half, if you look at the referee, you see. Maybe some decision against us, uh, which is uh, 50-50, and uh, in the other side, same, you know. So always the same. When when you lose a game, you you look at the referee, and when you win, you you don't look at it. So, but I felt there were mistakes both sides, and it's normal. Uh, the referee is a human; <laughs> he can't be a hundred percent right. But uh, I didn't feel like uh, Leinster was um, maybe. Um, uh, uh, we were advantage uh, about uh, about Leinster. It was carnage, mate, both ways. So there were things went for both sides. I think that was clear to see, but it was the speed of the game. And as you mentioned, refs are human, right? So they can't catch everything. It's impossible. But the speed of the game meant that some things got let go, some things were caught, um, but it was one hell of a game. Like now that you've two Champions Cups, what do you do to refocus the mind now? So you've got, the week off, we'll be hanging out on Thursday and not doing something ridiculous together. That's a great way to prepare, isn't it, for the rest of it? Spend some time <laughs> with Johnny, yeah. Bring you down to it. I'll bring you back down with a bump, exactly. You won't have any barrage this weekend, so you have a weekend off. But what have the messages been from Rog? Now, double Champions Cup winners, but going search of that holy grail. Going to find a top 14 Brennus. What's Rog been saying since the, since the final? Well... It- of course, he's speaking about Brennus, but uh, I'm not sure he, he needs to. Uh, you know, last year, when I won the Champions Cup, when we won, uh, my thought was, well, season is over. And and it was like my first title. Um, we had uh, to win on the weekend in Lyon to play a barrage on the next week against Toulouse. <clears throat> Honestly, like, um, it was tough. But this year, like, you know, you always want more. You want to improve. Uh, we've got the Champions Cup. Okay, great. But do we keep it like last year and that's it? Or do we try to improve again this year? So all the players are um, really motivated uh, motivated to um, to go to go far in top 14 as well. And uh, same we as well. Uh, we know that maybe is, this area of La Rocha is, is, it doesn't gonna last for ages. And um, you have like guys like Roman Sazi uh, finishing at the end of the year. Uh, I think he won a, he would like a final of top 14 as well. Uh, you know, Brice Dulin is not too young as well. He, <laughs> when you're close like this, you won the final as well. So, no, plenty of stuff made that, uh, honestly, Rog doesn't need to talk uh, talk a lot about uh, motivation. And what was that like? You mentioned for Roman Sazi, the sheriff, who's been at Montauban. He's been everywhere. Great player and a great servant in the top 14. But what was that moment like? Leaving the party aside, but being able to walk into the stadium. We saw the trophy presentation this week where you've got one and he's got one from last season as well. Like, How special is that to share those types of moments with players that you know are coming to the end of their career? Well, it's important. Important, but like we said, the, uh, the his end of the, of career is not. It was not on Saturday. Like uh, it's potentially uh, after the semi final. I want to push it back after the final. So um, <clears throat> we'll be uh, working out for for him for us. Um, doing the same, uh, like I said, for the for, uh, for the final of Champions Cup, just doing a job. Doing a business, we are for a business, and at the end of the season now we'll uh, we'll have a big party with him. We we'll have a big party as well with all the players leaving the club, um, and and that's it. We we're, we're back uh, back in our, our routine and our, our training training mode. 
And on the fact that you don't know how long this era for the club is going to last, whether it's going to be a dynasty for God knows how many years to come, or it could end at any point. But on the club itself and Ronan Ogara, obviously La Rochelle were in the second tier only nine years ago. And a lot of good work was done before Ronan got to the club. But can you put your finger on how he's taken you to that next level since he arrived in 2019 and then obviously took over from Johnny Gibbs? Well, well, always said, uh, I said it last year, like we won the title. Uh, great, we were 23 players on the pitch, but uh, there is so many more behind, you know. All the guy who who um, brought the club in uh, in top 14, or the guy who brought the club in uh, in the top six, uh, um, like the job uh, Corazzo did, the job uh, Jono did at the, after. And um, and of course, Roj um, improved, uh, made made a big, uh, big improve to the to the club as well. Uh, by maybe we were seeing us as a small club, you know, every time. Uh, Having too much uh, humility, uh, saying, "Well, we we are the underdogs," and Rog came and said, "No, look at you around. Look at the team. You're not underdogs. You now you you want to win, and you're gonna win. You know, kind of change the mentality of the club." Johnny, we chatted about this before you joined us. Like now, Greg says everyone else sees as a as a little club. We we let them do that, and and they definitely see themselves, rightly so, as a massive club. They are no longer a little club. Even when you saw the scenes remarkably, I can remember being in France and them getting promoted from Pro D2 to top 14. And there was already something special in the fabric of the scenes that you saw, the people supporting the club and some of the players they already have you had there. You have to remember, Antonio was there, Boccia was there. Some of the players, the foundations were already there and they've just added layer on layer, whether it's players, depth, detail, coaching, energy, the attitude, the infrastructure of the club. If you go and see the place, it is sensational. So. Look, it's now turning into an institution. And like one of the words that I love that Rog has thrown out in the past few weeks is a dynasty. They're now on the cusp of creating a dynasty, something that is an absolute monster of a club and threatens to keep on churning. When you look at the players, the quality and how well organized you boys are, um, it's incredible to watch. So yeah, you're definitely no longer a little club. You're one of the giants of world club rugby, which is very, very cool to be part of. And just finally, Greg, we've got to let you go. You've got business to attend to as you've been saying throughout this it's business time it's the end of the season it's not over yet get back to the top 14 grind it's only six years since you were playing for osh in the third tier of french rugby you're a six nations grand slam winner a two-time champions cup winner a european player of the year you're going to tell me i'm really not helping you here with your grind for the next title but at some point you've got to reflect on that surely and just be like what a rise yeah, but every time, the, every time people ask me that, I, I, I say like, and this is true. It's a, I'm, I'm not looking behind me. Like I don't have time because every every week you have a new game. Every week you have a, a new um, objective. So it's hard to uh, to have a have a seat and say, uh, well, what happens uh, for the last six years? So I think it's something like at the end of my career when I get like plenty of time and going back on my uh, my A and my uh, all the years. I'm going to say like maybe it's been quick, but um, I'm not thinking about this at the moment. Um, um, yeah, I'm just uh, enjoying enjoying the time, enjoying the present. And we'll see about the past when uh, when I'll be in my chair uh, watching uh, the young uh, young players play. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like Johnny now. Case in point. <laughs> exactly. You forgot to add, he's also become a media podcast maestro. There you go. Something else to add to your CV, Greg. Massive congratulations. Thanks, guys. Get in the car. We do not want to make you late for an Nogara. And Johnny, he's had enough beers over the last week. No beers on Thursday, okay? Oh, mate, I've had wait. There won't be any. <laughs> not with me. There'll be no beers. The past 10 days has been horrendous. Lee good. Um, but, mate, I'll see you Thursday. You get on with what you need to do and look forward to catching up properly and seeing you around not together. Yeah, see you over there. Cheers, Cheers mate. Cheers, Greg. Congratulations. Well, we finally caught up with Greg. Great to hear him chat about his week, week and a half since, and it's been epic. But before we come to talking about Greg, Johnny, what's going on? You, you're keeping him waiting, the European Player of the Year. So rude, I know. <laughs> um, well, they were on it all last week, so it's quite hard to catch up. And then we didn't record last week because Greg was obviously preoccupied. Don't blame I've... Greg, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I've also been on... a 
Tour de France. So I've been in near enough half of the host cities now for the World Cup, mm. uh, filming sort of previews, teasers, and sort of showing everyone what they can expect when they get here during the competition, which has been epic. So I've been up in Paris with Finn Russell. We were boat tripping on the Seine. We were getting up the Eiffel Tower. We went to Moulin Rouge together, sat and watched it with Webb Ellis Cup. Uh, I had a bakery class with Juan Imhoff. I had lunch with Yannick Yanga. Then went from there to Lille, where I went to a brewery with Joe Rocco Coco. We went, nearly got bareback um, horse riding with Joe. Um, <laughs> mate, we've done everything. Went from Lille all the way down to Bordeaux. Did some um, cheese mongering and learning about cheese with Big Ben Tamifuna. Um, Big oh, Ben, which was loves fantastic. His cheese, loves his cheese. Um, <laughs> It's not easy being cheesy. That's why every <laughs> every second or third try. So it was great to catch up with Big Ben. Um, that was a nine and a half hour drive down from Lille to Bordeaux, but great to catch up with him. We did some wine tasting as well. Went to Lem- Remy Lamarat's new vineyard, which you can all check out when you come here for the World Cup in Toulouse. And then, sorry, in Bordeaux. And then went from Bordeaux to Toulouse, where we caught up with Coach Kano. He took us around, showed us all the sights, the markets, we had a great time in Toulouse. And this morning we were driving from Toulouse to Marseille. Marseille, we've got a full day tomorrow with Paul Willemso. We're doing boat tripping, we're going fishing, rooftop barring. Someone's got to do it, Tim. Um, yeah. So they signed me up for the job. Uh, but on the way down to Marseille, and this is where we stuffed up, director, producer, and cameraman Ollie, who's a lovely bloke, and he's been filming everything. He's absolutely exhausted. He's up editing till two in the morning. Um, but he was in charge of driving the second half of the route. I took the first leg, he took the second. He took about 16 wrong turns. He then put in the wrong hotel and we ended up being 45 minutes late to record the podcast. So I got caught with my pants down, not blaming anyone apart from myself. Um, but just great to see Greg's face as I'll be seeing him again. We're from Marseille, we're flying up to Nantes. I'll be doing Nantes another host time with Greg. So we'll be catching up and showing everybody what you can expect to do in Nantes. I have no idea what we're going to be doing there, but we could see him anyway, catch up, probably have a beer or a glass of wine and have a laugh. But it's been a fairly hectic 10 days, but it's been very, very cool. You're not blaming anyone else apart from yourself, apart from Greg for missing last week's podcast. <laughs> Ollie for being late for today. <laughs> but anyway, here is the formal apology for not putting out a podcast. Sorry. In the week We're after- sorry. A French victory, a Greg victory in the Champions Cup final. We are sorry. It's better to wait, have him talking sense, or not be half cut, um, and to get it properly. So it's been worth the wait, I hope, for everyone. Um, and he would say the same, waiting for two Champions Cups. It's been worth the wait to hear this podcast and get the update from Greg. Well done, Tim. It is. And in the half of the chat that you were here for, Johnny. <laughs> the half so bad. That's appalling. In the bits that you're here for, um, really interesting insight into their mentality and the fact that he basically predicted what was going to happen before the game itself, and they just had belief throughout. It was incredible. And again, I can't get inside the... I don't know the inner workings of Rog and how he motivates his troops, but they've clearly got a game plan and power players that they believe in themselves. That Even if you do go... 5, 10, 15, it doesn't really matter because you're capable of scoring points. You can fire shots. They've got a set piece that functions. They've got strike plays that work, that open up doors and create chaos. So it was incredible um, to see what happened in the first 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then to see the comeback. Like I can't think of another final like that. It was incredible to watch, but it just shows the mental strength and the endurance, the resilience these boys have alongside the skill set and the talent that they all clearly have as well. But to show mentally what they were able to do, bring themselves back into that game and the manner with which they did it. Um, Yeah, I can't think of another one. It was just incredible to watch. Yeah, best Champions Cup final ever. Yeah, easy. Almost unanimous. Easy. Um, That's the thing. It couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch. Like, Big Will, Greg, like Brice Doulin, uh, Romain Sazi, the guys that Greg mentioned, um, all really good blokes as well. And that's the thing. When these things come together and you have a group that A, get on well, play well together, like you des- you're happy for them. You know, there's other teams that have it and they're, they're too good or they're, they're maybe a level above the rest and they're not good with it. But these boys, great with it. Great to see them doing so well. Great to see them elevating their club, which, as I said, was a little club potentially 
a decade ago, now is no longer the case. They've done something that is miraculous. The coaching group, the staff, the president, and the support that they have there is now clearly when people look in envy of pretty much every rugby player and every coach in European rugby. It is just another level. So well done to them. Exceptional to watch. Um, and yeah, top 14 title. Is it coming their way? You wouldn't bet against it. Right. We'll chat a bit about the final round of the regular season in the top 14 as a whole in a minute. But let's find out what your meter moment of the week is first, Johnny. It was the emotion, which isn't like me. We talk, uh, Greg, <laughs> going back to like business. It's business. Um, but it was a week of high emotion. When you consider some of the players that we saw depart, uh, play their last game, um, I just thought some of the images that we saw, Sergio Parise with his wife, with kids in the stadium, Mathieu Bastereau, his last game as well, um, in Toulon, having his mum there, his missus there, the kids in the stadium, getting their farewells, playing exceptionally well, the pair of them as well. Uh, but to see two modern greats, uh, different positions, but going out with a smile on their faces, head held high and enjoying their last game of rugby was pretty cool. Um, so I would say that would be, I'm not sure we've had an emotional one like this before, Tim, but I'd say that would no. easily be, no, don't cry. We're all welling up. Um, easily, easily this week's meter moment of the week. And again, the journey for me continues. I'll be hanging out with those boys next week. I'll be meeting up with Sergio and Nice. Oh, uh, the media nice together. And um, <laughs> Basta will be with me in Leon. So, Looking forward to having a beer with them, toasting their retirement and wishing them the best in the next chapter. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better with their game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can now get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's French Pod 10, and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. Give one to Sergio and Mathieu next week, Johnny, yeah? No, they'll be straight on their barbecues, on their planchas. They're going to gain some serious kilos. Welcome to my world, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> the final round of the regular season in the top 14. Yep. Leon hammered by on to confirm their place in the playoffs. And a lot of the other teams around them, Lost, so they ended up finishing third, courtesy save a better head to head record compared to Stade Francais, didn't they? Well, I believe I called this exact order just a couple of weeks ago, Tim. Okay, no, I don't think I did, I think I'm making that up, but <laughs> um, yeah, Leon, and again, it, you got to think there was mutiny, mutiny in the camp three weeks ago, um, but here they are, they find themselves with a quarter final to play for. They did hammer by on it, was close, um, up until about half time, and then Leon pulled away second half. Bayon, to touch on them briefly, to go from Pro D2 to finishing in the top eight and getting Champions Cup rugby is phenomenal. They could potentially have been, you know, that one win if it had gone their way, the first team to have ever gone Pro D2 to finishing the top six and making the, the playoffs. So quite rightly, this morning, Greg Patat, the Bayon coach, has had a contract extension in 2026. He has achieved an incredible amount in his short tenure there. But, but Leon, you're right, mutiny in the camp a few weeks ago and now they find themselves that's incredible so they do have a home tie against Bordeaux who led the charge earlier um, a bit of a shift as well and now we'll have Stade Francais playing against Racing so you've got a Parisian derby and the other one but Lyon against Bordeaux like these teams now they've been so up and down the past month and a half that I can't call any of them um, so it really is a lottery for me as to who goes through and who plays against Toulouse and La Rochelle but incredible scenes for Leon, considering what's happened over the past month, to find themselves now with a home quarter and a real chance of making it through the next round. So an incredible bang to finish with for them, smashing by on, and who knows what can happen now. It shows how bad my memory is. that I was more than willing to let you get away with. Yeah, I called this all a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, easy. <laughs> um, but the one thing we did call was that Toulon would be the one to miss out. Um, and sadly for them, just missing out, but you know, I don't think they did. over the course of the season, injuries they've had and how they played, they didn't deserve to be there come the final six. And of course, chatting to Tristan Tedder a couple of weeks ago, it was always unlikely that they were going to jump up to third from bottom, but they have got the dreaded playoff. The playoff match, I know, against Grenoble. Um, in Grenoble, it's, it's different though, because in years past, there's been a little bit of 
like some of the teams coming up and probably do have been heavily armed. So the teams that have lost out and played that access match have been packed full of talent. Whereas if you look at that Grenoble side, there's a couple of boys, but there's not really the strength and depth to compete with a Perpignan who are still, when you look at their squad, they're fully loaded. They've got some serious athletes and some power. So I think normally, statistically, it goes in the favour of the Prodi Du side playing at home, but I'm backing Perpignan to go away from home and maintain their place in the top 14. And let's have a little look at the barrage then. You mentioned the Paris derby, Stade Francais v Racing, and there's been some interesting games between those two of late, haven't there? Oh, there's been carnage. I mean, utter carnage both ways uh, in Jean Bouin uh, and also La Défense Arena. So I honestly, that is for me, it's a coin toss. In a 50-50, you have a Finn Russell performance they could demolish Stade Francais. You also have Sekou Makalu who can pop up with Jory Seconds and cause utter carnage. So I, I genuinely have no idea. But what is exciting is the sort of added layer of spice. This is a shot of getting into semi-final, but it's also a derby match. And that generally means that these types of games, it isn't going to be pretty rugby, you know, pods of play, classy starter plays. It's going to be roll the sleeves up. Who wants this more? <laughs> Running off nine, grudge match. So uh, looking forward to it. There's sure to be some fireworks as well because there's a few boys that are mates there, but they're also quite feisty. Um, so looking forward to that one. I'll be doing both these games from a studio in Paris for Viaplay and for Flow Sports. So yeah, looking forward to them both massively. You mentioned that was a coin toss. Make sure there's eye contact, yeah. yeah otherwise it could all kick <laughs> off in the tunnel, couldn't it? Has to be in France. Has to be eye contact at the coin toss. And when you're choosing, it's very important when you're shaking hands, eye contact, and when you're chinking drinks, when you're chinking glasses, you're looking in eyes. It's very important. So two times. I say it flippantly, but uh, not meaning to be flippant. It's important. These things matter. Hey, it's a cultural things. It's, it's just part of life in France. Those are two things that you do. Everyone knows it here. When you don't, everyone's like, that's weird. So yeah, there's no wonder they thought it was weird. Absolutely. Leon Bordeaux. Now, for a long time, you would have said, you mentioned mutiny in the Leon camp, but, but mm. Bordeaux have, have been on a roll in recent years and been looking very good. But actually, Leon are third place and Bordeaux have finished significantly below them. Mm -hmm. Is home advantage going to be a massive deal in this one? Yeah, it always is. Um, it, like statistically, if you look back through the teams that win it, it counts massively um, a home barrage or home quarterfinal. So, look, it's two teams, two teams that have had tumultuous seasons. Christophe Urios left. Bordeaux, when they were 8th, ninth, they've managed to work themselves back up. Mathieu, Ballers, ba Mathieu Jalibert has come back into fitness um, and he's leading the side really well. Leon's another one that up and down, like they've both been inconsistent. But the fact that you have players like Joshua Tuasova coming back in that cause real damage um, and are pretty much unstoppable. He was insane again at the weekend against Bayonne. Um, I don't know. I think that is the type of game where home advantage will be massive. You're at home, you're playing for semi-final, you've got your home crowd. Bordeaux, there won't be much travelling support. Um, but you know, they've got nothing to lose. So it's another one that, these aren't teams that have dominated. They're both, when you look at Stade Francais, Racing, Lyon and Bordeaux, I would say they're all on a similar level. Capable of being absolutely fantastic on their day, but equally capable of being average. So uh, the first one was a toss of a coin. I'm going to say the second one isn't far off. Leon, I would give a slight advantage because they're home, home support, home comforts and the rest of it. But Bordeaux are a talented bunch. Um, some decent players that can cause some cause some serious damage. So no, again, 55% in the favour of Leon. Um, but I think it'll be tight. And a few other bits of news. It's because of the preparations for the Olympics, but France have confirmed they're playing their Six Nations home games next year in Marseille, Lille and Lyon. You're in the middle, obviously, of a massive France-wide tour at the moment, Johnny. What do you make of that? How big is that going to be, playing those games in different places? I think it's phenomenal. And I think it should be done more. Like The Stade de France is, don't get me wrong, it's, it is tremendous. It is what it is. But the heart of French rugby is in the south of France. So Lille right up north, um, completely different, but taking one game to the north, which I get. Um, but Lyon, massive, massive city with a huge population base and they would love to host the game. And Marseille the same. I've just arrived here this afternoon. Um, and you come into the town, beautiful setting, like in terms of a different destination for people to come and visit as well and offer something different. Um, each of those different cities 
will offer something to the traveling public, but also importantly to the French rugby public, a home game in a different part of the country. France is massive. I think people forget how big a country this is. I said earlier, it took us nine and a half hours to drive from Lille to Bordeaux. That gives you a size of the scale of the place. And that Bordeaux's not even in the deep south. So um, I think it's a good thing. Um, it's good to move it around. It will give the players, I think, a little bit of an appetite for different parts of France. I think if you're a foreign player as well coming over, you just see Paris and that's one thing you see, but to come over and see these different cultures, different little parts of France with their own different um, foods, weathers, weathers, weather, um, climates and and the personality quirks and each of these different little towns um, have very different identities. So no, I think it's a good thing. And Cheslin Colby, he's living too long early, isn't he, Johnny? He is. So weirdly, we talked about Matthew Bastro and Sergio Parise. They had a sort of guard of honour for those boys walking off at the end of the game. And Cheslin Colby actually added himself to the, the guard of honour and walked down it with him. Um, and we saw the emotion that he displayed at the end of the game, their final last weekend in Dublin in, in floods of tears. And I think there's always been quite a bit going on behind the scenes in that he's had, or the club has had an offer for his contract to be bought from a Japanese club. They've accepted, they've worked out a deal and he's gone. Um, so how much is that is, is instigated by Rock Nation and by Cheslin himself? And how much does he want to go? He obviously left a year early from Toulouse. He's now leaving a year early from his contract from Toulon. Um, how much of that is pushed from his end and how much is that is pushed from a business or a commercial sense from Toulon and the Japanese club? We don't know, but um, it's just one of these things. It's a business. He's moving on. Um, and the rumor is he'll be the best paid player on the planet when he moves to Japan next season. And both sides will say different things and we probably never will know who instigated it or who is the main driver behind it. But just stepping back a bit, it looks like it kind of works for everyone, doesn't it? Cheslin, as long as he's happy to move to Japan, he gets a massive contract. Toulon get a transfer fee and they can use it for the players and he only had a year left on his deal. Well, you have to think if you go for Toulon for the business case, so Toulon bought his contract. So they paid a million euros to get him just out of his contract from Toulouse. That in itself, the fact that you're getting a million plus from a Japanese club wipes that clean. Um, and this wouldn't go through if Cheslin wasn't happy. If, if Cheslin Colby was to say, look, I don't want to go. I'm not arranging personal terms. I'm not moving to Japan. He wouldn't move to Japan. So clearly there's enough money on the table that for him and his family, they decided it's feasible, it's doable, and they'll go to another beautiful part of the world and enjoy a different country and be very, very well paid and enjoy a different league. So um, there are different moving parts to it, but every single party there has to be on board in agreement uh, and sign on the dotted line for it to happen. So, um, yeah, there we go. We don't know who pushed it or from which side it was forced or pushed, but everyone's in agreement at the end and it's going to go through. And another potential huge money move, we chatted to Tristan Tedder a couple of weeks ago. He said they weren't necessarily getting another fly half in Racing. He'd been told, you said, there's no way. Racing are big spenders, massive club, they're going to want a marquee signing. The word is Marcus Smith has been visiting Paris and that's moving along. Can you say it happening? Where has that word come from, Tim? Where did you get that? Not me, that's for sure. Also, interestingly, chatting to Joe Rococo during the week, he was saying the same thing. Like, There's two boys that are there. Antoine Gibert, they rate really highly. But if there was somebody that was the right fit and it was the right time, they would go for them. Um, and that wasn't necessarily this year. That was more for the season after next. Um, so I don't know. Is the honest answer? Would Marcus Smith give up on England caps, move out of Harlequins and move to Paris? I mean, given the surface they have, given the way they want to play, the attractive style and the speed, he'd be a great fit. Um, but is that what he wants to do at this stage of his career? I don't know. Um, so that, I guess, will come out in the wash in the next couple of weeks, I think they'll probably wait until they've either lost or finished their season um, or won the top 14. We'll wait and see. But um, I don't know. I'd watch, I'd watch that space because I don't think they're the type of club to not go for a marquee 10, but it would have to be the right person, the right timing. Um, and as they said, that's not necessarily this year coming. So, so we'll wait and see. We will wait and see in the next couple of weeks on that. And just give us an insight you have been all over the place. You mentioned Paul Willems to tomorrow. You mentioned yeah. Sergio Parise, Matthew Bastro. Yeah. Just lay it out in full for us the next 
week or so. I know you're doing the barrage as well, but who are you seeing and where? And when and when can we see this stuff as well? When is it coming out? Do you know who I'm not seeing? My family. They're absolutely <laughs> delighted. <laughs> that was that was my next question, actually, was how is Jen? <laughs> She's good. She's got her her folks are there at the minute. Oh um, good. So you but it's been bank holiday Mondays and you know it's been holiday days. So she's had all three at home, but she's had help, which has been good. Um what has it looked like? It's looked like Paris with Finn and the boys, then Joe Rock, Coco and Lille, then Bordeaux with Big Ben, then Jerome Kano and Toulouse. Tomorrow will be Paul Valemsa in Marseille. Friday, I think, is Sergio in Nice. Then I have to fly to Paris for the studio and do the barrage on Saturday and Sunday. Then I think Monday next week, it will be Mathieu Bastaro in Lyon. Eventually, we'll have Will Skelton at some point as well in Saint-Étienne joining us there. Um, I think that's it. Unless I think I've named all of the host times. I think I might have missed one, but that's it. Um, And this will all be coming out on the World Rugby and the Rugby World Cup and the Rugby World Cup 2023 platform. So it's just to give everybody that's coming over to watch the competition a little taste of what they can expect in each host town. Um, And it's been epic, mate, from speaking to people with their charcuterie stalls to eating some oysters to steak tartars to everything and everything in between that has been French bit of wine tasting it's just been it's been very very cool so looking forward to sharing with everybody um and i think it'll go on youtube and instagram facebook all these types of things um so you can have a little sneak peek and see what's in store when you come over in september and october yeah the one you missed was jen in by on next friday something like that <laughs> <laughs> manana manana <laughs> Enjoy your whirlwind trip around France and the barrage this weekend. Thanks, Johnny. A massive thanks to Greg for joining us as well. Finally, after a week and a half of celebrations, not a week and a half. He had five days and that was it, he said. So, hey, well deserved. Well deserved. Absolutely. And thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Fuck!